How's everybody doing? It's a rainy day, so I'm inside. And uh, I know some of you just tune in for the Hear the Birds. And I'm sorry. I, I, maybe next time I do it inside, I'll put on one of those white noise things with, with birds in the background. So anyway, we're in uh, Revelation, and we're working our way through, the, through that amazing book. And one of the things I've always found interesting or almost odd about Revelation is there's... Um, it's almost like th um, um, multiple books in in the sense that if you look at the opening, there's like three openings. It starts, then it starts again, and then it starts again. And also, the sec the chapters two and three, because we start out with the letter and with, with introduction, introduction chapter one. The chapters two and three go to these seven churches, and each one of them gets addressed, and then it goes to the to the big story, and it's. It's almost like chapters two and three are almost like a separate book. They're not, but it feels that way somewhat to me. And we're going to be spending the we're going to spend we're going to be looking at um, the seven churches, and we're actually going to take one day per church. Now I've been talking all along about how you want to make sure you're doing big picture stuff and all that stuff. And here's the deal: we're going to go really fine detail in these seven churches because. As you look at each one individually and you look at it in a very detailed way, looking at the city that it's written to and learning about that, you'll learn amazing things. And it's reflected in the letters. Each letter is reflected to each city very specifically. And it's really cool. And there was a guy named uh, Colin Hamer, who I think is pronouncing his name right, who wrote, wrote a book a few years ago about the seven letters and the seven churches and all the archaeology and all the history they've done. And so we're going to dig into that, and it's just cool stuff. Now, before we start, every one of the letters, they are roughly like uh, letters, like Paul's letters. There's a, there's a similarity in that there's a format. Every one of them starts out with a greeting, you know, to the church, to the angel of the church of. Then there's a description of God, the one who's, or Jesus, the one who's speaking. Then there's a commendation. Here's what you're doing right most of the time. Then there's a condemnation most of the time. Here's what you're doing wrong. Then there's a challenge. Then there's a call to listen, and it's identical every time. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Every one of them says that. And then there's a promise that God gives them if they live into what God's been telling them or Jesus has been telling them in the thing. And each one, we're going to start out by talking about the city because every city, like I said, the background information makes the letter pop. When, when you read the background information, for every one of them, all the history, the letter just goes boom and it gets even better. So um, we're talking about the letter to the Ephesians. We'll read it in just a minute. It's seven verses long. And it's to the church at Ephesus, the Ephesians. There's actually a lot we know from the New Testament about the church at Ephesus. It's, it is one of the ones we know the best. Um, Paul visited the, the area. There was a huge riot at Ephesus in the book of Acts because of Paul. Paul caused a riot, which is, you know, that's one of my life goals. Um, it's, um, and there's, of course, the letter to the Ephesians, um, the, uh, Tim wants to know about the angel of the church at Spout Springs. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll cover that. Uh, the, um, uh, when I'm inside, I can actually read what you guys write. When I'm outside, I can't see it. Um, Ephesus was the number one city in this area. And just so you know, all seven churches are in what we now call Turkey. Okay, they're in that what was they called it Asia Minor then. We would call the whole area Turkey. They're all relatively close together. They're in a definite region. And um, Ephesus was the leading city because it had a great location. All the roads came to it and there was an amazing harbor. But it was cool about the harbor was it was incredibly unstable. But it was very sandy. And so the harbor moved. As it silted in, the silt would come down the rivers into there and silt, and the harbor would move around, and they'd have to move the city as the harbor kind of moved. And if you go there today, if you go to Ephesus, it's not even near the ocean. It's completely silted over. It's like six miles, six or seven miles from the ocean is where Ephesus was, and it was a leading harbor 2,000 years ago. Um, in addition to the importance of the city commercially, it was also a religious center, um, very religious city, um, temple to Artemis or Diana. Um, of the Ephesians was a huge thing, and the city moved. The temple never did. The temple never moved because the temple was supposedly at a place where the, there had been this tree. I don't, I don't know if the tree was still there. Or there, I can't really tell from the, my research. But there had been a tree that was the base for the worship of Artemis or Diana, that goddess, and so that had to be beside the tree. 
And so they could rebuild the temple, but it had to stay in that spot. Even as the city moved around them, the worship of Diana or Artemis was huge. And the, the temple was 425 feet long. That's a football field plus a quarter. 220 feet wide and 60 feet high. The, the, the 127 pillars were made of a special marble and 36 of them were overlaid with gold and jewels. So this is an amazing, huge, big city. And they've obviously got a church because the letter to the Church of Ephesians was written to them. Um, and Paul visited there. So now let's, let's read the letter and then we'll walk through it, okay? And we'll take what we've learned and what we know from history and we'll apply it into this letter. To the angel of the church at Ephesus right now. What we said yesterday, if you want to hear the full discussion, you can go back and watch yesterday where I talked about when it says the angel of the church. Angel can mean messenger, but I don't think it means pastor. It could mean guardian angel. That's very possible. But my personal weird view is that, and this is going to sound really odd and almost new agey, but I think there's some truth to it. We picture churches as being a physical group of people. We don't try to picture them as a building, but it's just a physical group of people. And I think the angel concept is representing both the physical group of people and the the um the power, the aura, as it were, the power of God that works through them, the, the supernatural presence. So it's the physical presence and the supernatural presence of that church. And if you don't like that, that's that's just Steve's weird idea. So don't 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 get upset about it. But that's when it says that. So I guess Spout Springs would have a spiritual presence in the world that we represent. We have a physical presence of our people, and then we have the spiritual presence. And that angel concept is him speaking to that entire bit. And there may be a guardian, an actual literal guardian angel involved as well. Okay. Now, so like I said, it starts out that then will be the description of God. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. And if you remember, that's exactly how Jesus was described in chapter one, it just brings it right over. So it's a, re a repeat. And then, so that was the description of Jesus. Then comes the commendation. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested these who, those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So that's a pretty good commendation. You guys are awesome. But, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first or your first love. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But if you but you have in, in this in your favor, you hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And we really don't know much about the Nicolaitans, except John hated them. <laughs> so it tells me they were pretty messed up, okay? Or the practices, not the people, the practices. Whoever ever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's identical in all seven letters. The one who is victor to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And that's the prom promise that's listed as the, at the end of the letter. So anyway, let's walk through it one little bit at a time. Okay, we already talked about the angel at church in Ephesus. Okay, So we're talking to the church. And we can, it's easier to just say, we're talking to the church at Ephesus. And he says this, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, walks among the seven golden lampstands, which we said was chapter one. Chapter one, he said the exact same thing about all that. Okay, and let's just ask a couple questions. What does it mean when he holds the stars? What's Jesus talking about himself when he holds the stars? If the stars represent the, the churches and their angels, then what does it mean? Well, one thing, being in the hand means protection. There's a number of Psalms that talk that. But there's also an intimacy and a possession that's there. There's an empowerment Saying you're in, my, you know, being the right arm is the arm biblically that it, where, where stuff gets done, and to be in His right hand means you're where stuff gets done. So this is a really cool picture that the God holds this specific church, and I think all churches, in His right hand. So He's protecting them. He's got them right there with Him. There, there's there's that, and there's that empowerment. And then it says, God, "Who walks among the lampstands?" That means God's with us. Okay. There's one thing that we, we sometimes, and I don't think it's wrong, but I, I, we may have done it, we try not to, um, where we like invite Jesus into our presence at church. Well, you don't have to invite, invite God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into your presence because he's here. He's already here. He's already in all of us. 
when we get together, he shows he, he's there first. And so, you know, a prayer that says, God, we want to listen to your spirit and we want to acknowledge your spirit. We want to obey your spirit. That's cool. But to say, to invite God's spirit into a worship service, you don't need to do that. He's already here. So he dwells among them. He walks among the candlesticks. Now, the commendation when he gives to the church at Ephesus is incredibly strong and cool. I mean, he, he's, I know your deeds. I know what you do. I know your hard work. Okay? You're not just going through the motions. You're, you're not stuck in some little routine. You're working hard at this whole Christian thing. I know your perseverance. It's not always easy when things happen, go bad. You keep trucking. You keep pushing. You do not, you are not quitters. You work hard and you don't quit. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. You're pure. You stand up for what's right. You, you don't just bow to whatever's going around you. You stand up for good. Okay? And you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. In other words, you're teaching solid. You've got good doctrine. You're not teaching weird stuff. You're not going off on some tangents with your theology. You guys teach the Bible and you teach it true, is how we translate that today. And you have not grown weary. You've got a good attitude. You because sometimes you know the person who perseveres with a poor attitude, right? They're they're still doing it, but they're whining the whole way. No, you've not grown weary. You're keeping it up. So you work hard. You don't do the motions. You persevere even when things get hard. You keep moving. You have purity. You hold God's standards and you hold them high. You have good doctrine. You don't put up with those who claim to be apostles that are not. And you've not grown weary. You've got a great attitude. This sounds like the perfect church. For one little itty bitty thing. Yet I hold this against you, verse 4. You have forsaken your first love. First love. Now, let's let's cover a couple things. That is not a romantic thing. Okay, let's 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 get this out of the way. Whenever the Bible talks about love, it's never talking about some ush, ushy gushy feeling. Now there's nothing wrong with having emotional feelings. That's not what he's talking about. It's not that you guys don't have the feelings. It's you don't have the priority. Um, first means first in importance and chronology. It is the most important thing to you is serving me. We just finished a study in the book of Colossians and in the church at Colossae, he was pushing him really hard. Make sure Jesus stays in the center of everything that you do and the center of your lives. Jesus is no longer the center. You're, this is scary. You're doing everything right but Jesus has moved out of the middle of your church. You're doing everything right, but Jesus is no longer the middle of your life. Isn't that scary? Because how many of us could, could fall into that thing? Love used to be the hallmark. They used to be the ones who Jesus was the absolute center of their faith, of their church. And now it's dropped down. Now, the question you might ask, when he says love... Is he talking about love for Jesus or love for others? And my answer to that is yes. <laughs> because Jesus is real clear that if you're going to love him, you have to love others. James makes it very clear. If you're going to say you love Jesus, you have to love others. To say that you love Jesus and don't love other people, that's just stupid because people are made in the image of God. I've used the illustration before. If somebody came in and put up you come into somebody's office, go into a guy's office, and there's a picture of his wife there. You go, I hate that picture. Well, you can't hate the image and not, you can't be hating on my wife. Get out of here. And for Jesus, if you hate the people, you're hating him in some sense. Remember, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. It's tied to it, hangs from it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do... Uh, so love is essential. And Paul would say that if you drop the love, which is what this church has done, you've got a problem. Um, Paul would say in, in 1 Corinthians 13, if you drop the love, you're only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So, I mean, I'll, I'll talk as somebody who's a professional Christian. I mean, and I've seen a couple. We've got a couple of professional Christians in the, in the group today. And as a professional Christian, it can get really easy 
to keep doing everything right and lose the love, lose the priority, lose, lose the, the, yeah, there's some emotion involved in that. If you're with God, you're going to have some emotional attachment and you lose all, Jesus stops being the middle. And if you're a pastor, what can happen is the church can become the middle. You're serving the church. You may not be serving Jesus. Your priority might be the church. It might not be Jesus. But Jesus has to be at the absolute center, and then the love you have for him has to radiate to other people, or you're missing out the most important thing. And how big a deal is this? Well, listen to the challenge. He says, remember the height from which you have fallen. Again, this is a church that works hard, perseveres, is pure, has great doctrine, and a great attitude. And you have fallen from a great height because you've left your first love. So now repent and do the things you did at first. You have to turn. You have to, you have to move back toward what God calls you to be and do. So repent, turn back toward God. Okay? And this is the threat or the challenge. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. I will kick you out. Think about that. Churches, think about that. If you don't have love, love for God and love for others as the center of your church, and it's easy to get there, you can be doing the, all the other things. You can be working hard. You can be persevering. You can keep your, your, you know, your standards high. You can have your doctrine can be on point and have a great attitude about it. And if Jesus and love for God and love for others isn't at the middle center piece of your church, you're doing it wrong. And God said, Jesus says, I may take your lampstand away. I may eliminate you as a church. That's serious stuff. Okay? And he does have this, this that will throw in as an odd line. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And I kind of wonder if that's just like a, 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 a he's still on a bone. Remember, I still love you. I still, we're still on the same side, but I, I need you to move. I need you to move back and move me back and move my love back to the center. Okay. Then, then it comes out. He who has an ear to hear, let the, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. It's exactly the same. Everyone. Pay attention to what I just told you. This is important stuff. And then there's a promise to him who overcomes. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And there's two things I see in that one. It says the tree of life. First off, it says the tree of life in the paradise of God. And that's going to pretty obviously be talking about the tree of life from um, the Garden of Eden, paradise of God. But I also think it points, secondly, to the cross, which is often called a tree in the way it's described. And that's the cross where we get life, the tree where we get life. But there's another one, too. And that's the fact that the, the temple of Artemis, the false god in Ephesus, was built around a tree. So the tree that's right, the tree of life, not the tree of falseness, the tree of life, I will give you the right to the real tree. So don't worry about the people who are all worshiping Diana and Artemis. Ignore them. I give you the tree of life. Now, here's what's really cool in my mind about this letter. Because we've got a letter to the church at Ephesus and saying, you have left your first love. You have, you've, you've screwed it up. You know, you're doing everything else right, but you left your first love. Okay. 30 years later, I'm not, I'm not making this up. 30 years later, a guy named Ignatius, who was the Bishop of Antioch, which is a, a city not that far away, wrote a letter to the Church of Ephesus. In his introduction, he wrote, I welcome in God your well-beloved name, which you possess by reason of your righteous nature, which we talked about that, which is char characterized by faith in and, ready, love of Jesus Christ, our Savior. When somebody writes 30 years later, the first thing he mentions is, everybody talks about how much you guys love God. Ding, 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 they listen. Okay? He also refers to their bishop, Onesimus, as a man of inexpressible love. Inexpressible love. It is possible. Very possible. For you, for your church, if your church drifts away from love for God and love for others being the center of the church, if it, if it, this sounds weird, doesn't it? It drifts 
into working hard, doing good things, keeping the doctrine clean, keeping morally pure, and keeping a good attitude, you can still drift. And if your church drifts away from love, even if it maintains those things, it's possible to come back and move love back to the center. And in your life, in my life, it's really easy to sub in everything else, isn't it? It's easy to sub in hard work. It's easy to sub in doing the right things. It's easy to sub in having your time with God every morning or afternoon or evening whenever you, you manage to pull that off. It's easy to sub in having a cheerful, great attitude. It's easy to sub in all these things. And it's like a, it's like a house built on sand where it's got a, a strong foundation. It's like a harbor built in sand, like the sand at Ephesus, where everything can look good on the surface, but the sand gradually washes away. The house we lived in before, the driveway, the whole, you know, this is the sand hills, everything built on sand. And the driveway was constantly having to, I'm, I'm pouring quick read into holes because the sand underneath it kept moving. Everything looked good until pff, there's a huge hole. And in your life, you can be doing everything right but slowly let something other than Jesus move into the center of your life and in the, the primary love of your life is loving Jesus and loving others. And if you feel that's happening, repent, turn back. God wants you to move that back to the center, wants the love of Christ and the love of others to be the center of your life. And it is perfectly good and okay to repent and turn back to that. For some of us, that's harder than others, but that's what God wants. God wants you not, if you're a detail, do things person, it's easy to make details and doing things the center of your life, right? It's easy to keep moral purity the center of your life. All these things, none of them could be the center except Jesus. So that's the letter to the Ephesians. That's our lesson for today. Come back tomorrow for, one, for another church, and you guys have a great day.